Yes, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today is the twelfth session of our lecture series on structural design of highway bridges, and uh, the expertise and knowledge shared by our esteemed speaker, Professor Isan Jaisinger, has been truly enlightening. The clarity and the depth of his presentations have provided us with valuable insights into the complexities of structural design, and we are fortunate to have had the opportunity to, to learn from him. Thank you, sir, and. For all the participants, kindly uh, add your membership number as well with your logging name so that ISL can trace your participation. And over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Bandhuka. Sorry about the delay because we have a small technical problem. Uh, That's okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, so uh, today we'll uh, continue the same lecture. But uh, we are going to uh, see how this can be practically used. This method can be practically used for designing a continuous beam. Right? So uh, last time I told you that when you have a beam, and we consider three span beam. So the spans can be like 40 meters, 50 meters, 40 meters. We'll assume that it's like that. And then uh, what happens is now any beam, so the structure will be something like this. So we, we use a simplified beam having something like this shape. And the actual beam, uh, you know, will be like this. Actual beam will be like this. So what we do is we convert it with the average values. So we make it like that. Something like that. So basically what we have is this one, but what we analyze can be something like this. On the other hand, if you have a good program that can calculate all the properties, uh, you can analyze this as well. So uh, generally, when you are analyzing it with uh, village analysis, uh, we can have one village beam here. We can represent this rib with one village beam. We can represent it here with another. And we can represent it here. So you will have four beads. Like that. And it will allow you to apply the loads where they are. Then let's say we get M1, M2, M3. And four. What we do is for this beam, we call it M1, M2. And for this beam, we call it M3. So we'll take the addition. We'll take the addition. And then what we do is we take the addition. And uh, we simplify it because uh, the whole idea of analyzing the box girder with four beams is uh, to get the torsional effects. And then uh, with the torsional effects, you can see how the loads are shared. And then the finally, what we need is a bending moment diagram. 
So, so we represent let's say beam one, beam two, each beam like this. Now, once you get the bending moment diagram, we can say, you know, this uh, beam that you get here is similar to this one. But the beam that you get here is similar to this one. So, uh, so, uh, if you have an I-beam like this, what will happen? Then uh, we have to think about an upper boundary on X and C-T and a lower boundary on X and C-T. Why? Because we can have the tendons ducks going like that, we can have the ducks going like that, we can have the ducks going like that. But there will be a maximum limit on that. So we have to mark two limits. Then if you have selected a p-value and we call it RP because, uh, you know, we are analyzing it under service. Under service, what we get is not P, what we get is RP and where R is about 70%. So it is 0.7 times P, what you get. The net pre-stressing force is 0.7 times P because we have to allow for losses. So once we allow for losses, now what we can see is we are going to get some boundary like that. And another boundary, another boundary like this. If you select the precision force, we get a boundary. Then what is our task? Our task is very straightforward. The task is fit a profile, fit a profile like that. Fit a profile like that. But this profile will have a special property. It will generate secondary moments that we have assumed. It will generate the secondary moments that we have assumed. So that's what we are going to do. We generate the secondary moments. That we have assumed. Is that clear? So, so that's the task. So which means which means that uh, we need a method that will allow us to find, we need a method that will allow us to find the secondary moments generated when you know that we are going to have a profile like this. We are going to have a profile like this. And we know the eccentricities E at each section. This is ES at each section. 
ES at each section is known. Then we need a method that will allow us to find the, the secondary moments M2, 2, and M2, C. Because these are supports 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the secondary moments will be like this. They are sagging and they will have the values M2, 2 here, M2, 3. So these are secondary moments and we need to find what are the values of these secondary moments. So there are two different methods, but the method that I'm going to show you is uh, is the one that suits more a, a computer program. So the method is, you know, I'm going to give only the result now, but uh, later uh, another day I'll show you how to prove it. So the second moment, so the pre force is P, RP. And so you can actually find the secondary moments by using a matrix because there are only two unknowns. You get a matrix of one sixth, two L one plus L two L three. So these lengths are L one, L two, L three. Now this result can be proved by using principle of virtual work, but we will not worry about the proof because uh, now we are interested in how to find it. L1 plus L2 plus L3. And here you get M2, 2, M2, 3. And this is equal to Integration beta one R P E D X integration beta two R P E D X. Uh, don't worry about these notations. I'm going to show you what is meant by all this beta and also uh, how to find this. So don't worry about the notation because it's only a notation, but the important thing you had to appreciate it. It is a, a matrix, M values, and then on this side, you get another two parameters. So by inverting the matrix, you can find the value of, uh, you can find the M2, 2, and M23. So the important thing is uh, just understanding that you know the secondary moments can be found by using a simple method. Just uh, try and understand it that way. But later, I will prove you know this is, uh, this, uh, this is based on a, a theory, so it can be proved. So we will not worry about the proof now because that will just complicate the methods. We will see how this uh, result can be used. So what I do is, I'll show you what is meant by this, the right hand side. The left hand side is pretty straight. So if you have 40 meter, 50 meter, 40 meter. So the left hand side of the metric is 1 sixth, 1 sixth, 2 is 90. 90 divided multiplied by 200. L3 means 40. Here L2 means 50. This means uh, again uh, 180. Again 180. 80, yes, 180. So that is L2 plus L3 is 90. 90 multiplied by 2 is 100. So Left hand side of the equation is pretty straightforward.
Now we are going to look at the right hand side. So when you have a beam like this, and also a cable inside that, like this, then uh, then uh, beta one means a para a function that varies from zero to one, zero to one, or this value zero to one, and uh, this is over forty, and so this is beta one, and then beta two is a function again that varies from one to zero to one, one to zero, or fifty meters and forty meters. So, if you look at what is meant by beta one, R P E D X integration, we know integration means an area. So, what will happen now? We have a a profile. We have a profile that goes like this, like this, we have a profile that goes like this. It goes like this. It goes over the support. It goes like this. Is a typical profile. Then I have a function beta that goes like that. So what will happen if I multiply e here by this one? Then I'm, I should get a function like this, less than this. And then goes like this. Stopping it because you see, because RP is constant, I can write this as RP as integration beta one e. Then what is the integration? Integration means the area of this diagram. Area of this diagram. So if you can find the area of this diagram over this over this 40 meters here and 50 meters here, over these 90 meters, if I can find the area of this diagram, then I can form the right hand side of the equation. Right hand side of the equation. Now you'll ask why I'm doing this. I have because you know I'm using a spreadsheet. So I cannot be calculating secondary moments myself. I have to include a method that the secondary moments can be calculated. So this is one of the methods of it. There's another method. That is based on load balance. Only problem is when you are going for load balancing method, the cable profile has to be parabolic for us to balance. Because last time also I showed you that uh, the, when you have a parabolic cable, parabolic cable, uh, WL squared of 8 is equal to P times C. So we can find equivalent loads. But all that is when the cable profile is perfectly parabolic. But if it is not parabolic, then, then uh, we need a better, better method. And this is the method that is uh, that can be proven. So, so because of that, uh, we are learning the method rather than the proof. Later, I will, another day, I'll show you the proof.
This is a method that is widely used in bridge design, not only for finding secondary movements, even the three pin use movements, or can be found by using this method. Right? So this is a standard method that is widely used in uh, widely used by bridge engineers to find the moments caused by a curvature. So basically, the the moment you apply a pre-stress, there will be a certain curvature at each section, and that curvature can give rise to a moment. And if you want to find a moment, you can use this particular method. You can make use of this particular method. So now I'm going to add go right. Now we see what happens. I'm going to draw the diagram again so that we can understand what's going on. So what I say is I'm having or three spans and the in the center line and I will have a cable that does this and beta one is going to be like this beta two will be like this and Then the first diagram I'm going to get is only up to this point. And when I multiply these two, because RP is taken out, this starts is zero, so it's zero. And it's a small value, so it has to be like this. It comes close to this value. Goes like this. And here you might get something like that. So this is the area that I have to find. And then I can find another beam. Now I am interested in these two. So I'm going to get something like this. And this area is what I am looking for. Now, if I am looking for an area, and we know when we have a beam, a pre stress concrete, always is 40 meters, 50 meters, 40 meters. We'll divide it into sections. Why? Because in pre stress concrete, uh, we have to design every section. So here I might go for some five meter intervals. So this is a long beam. So I cannot have, uh, so I cannot have one, uh, you know, one meter interval, then, then it will be massive calculation. So I have to be reasonable. So I will select sections at five meter intervals. So 50 meters means one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So here I'll get 10 sections. Here I'll get eight sections. So how can I find an area when the parameters are known? So a function like this. A1, A2, A3, this edge, this edge. What is the area? Area is based on Simpson. That is H by 3, A1 plus 4, A2 plus A3. Now, if you have four of them, You get A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. Then the area will be H by 3, 
a1 plus 4a2 plus 2a3 plus 4a4 plus a5. How do you get it? So for this one, you get a1, 4a1, h, a2, h3. Next one, you get a3, 4a2, a4. So once you add this, you will get this. So that means, you know, very easily we can find the area and uh, that is the right hand side of the equation. Because we know the profile, we have selected the profile and we want to find the second. So if you know the profile, if you know the pre stress, you can find the right hand side of this equation or the matrix which involves a numerical integration by using Simpson rule. So this is the method that we use. So, which means I cannot find it numerically because I don't have the values, but uh, I can show it on a spreadsheet how to do that, how to do that, right? So, so, the ideal thing is to see how this can be done on a spreadsheet, right? So, uh, okay, right. Then, uh, so what we do is uh, we will, uh, I'll share the screen and I'll go for a spreadsheet. But this spreadsheet is written for a real case, actual bridge. So I have considered various stages. But again, uh, uh, to explain all this, I don't need all the stages. What I need is only a bending moment and you know. Right, and then I would have to select the pre stressing force, and then I have to see what are the boundaries, and then I have to select a profile. And for that profile, I can calculate the secondary moments. Right, so I'm going to show you how this is done. Right, so basically, uh, the steps I'm going to show you would be. So in the example, you know, it's a because I have to generate a real example. I have generated a real one, uh, but uh, these are the important things you have to uh, observe. So what are things we have to observe? Because when we have a beam. It will be subjected to self-fate, superimposed dead load, and uh, live loads. All these different loads. And we know when we, uh, when we select a bridge, we know these things. If you have a beam, We get a many moment in law. Like this. And many moment in law. And the many moment due to self age will be in between. Will be in between. And we call this uh, maximum in B the minimum in A. Right. Now, 
then that is the first step. What is second step? Second step is now uh, I told you there's a huge problem because uh, the moment we generate uh, these uh, values, we get uh, we get uh, a second moment. So the method is we are going to assume secondary moments to be part of the actual the bending moment uh, bending moment due to the dead weight due to the dead weight so we have assumed we assume it to be part of the dead weight so the moment you do that what will be the bending moment values now the bending moment values will be measured from the new origin from the new one. And this will be the final moment. This is the final moment. Because in a continuous beam, we have bending moment due to loading plus into. Now what we have done is we have uh, so M2 is not known generally until we end the design. So we have simplified it by assuming a value of M2. A value of M2. Only thing is when you are assuming, uh, we, are, we are assuming it is as a function of dead load moment. So we like it to be about 80%, 0 and 80% of the dead load. We don't like it to be more than 100% because if we have more, anything more than 100%, the beam will definitely lift up during the construction and causing huge problems to the construction activity. So we can't allow that to happen. So because of that reason, we make sure when we are uplifting the beam, we are uplifting it only by a fraction of the uh, self weight moment, but it can be a substantial fraction, something like 80%, going up to 80%. Going beyond that is not uh, very good because uh, if the beam lifts up from the supports during construction, it can cause huge instability problems. The actual beam might even collapse because now it has no stability because it's not supported. So because of that, then we are going to assume it to be like this. So now our task is finding a profile that will generate exactly the same uh, moments that we have assumed for secondary moments or reactant moments. So what is the second step? Because we know all the final moments, once we select a pre-stressing force, always I call it RP because it's we cannot pre select a pre stressing force without the losses. So, so first we select the pre stressing force P, and then we consider how much is available for our calculations. It will be only about 70%, because 30% will be lost. So, we know the final moments, we know the final pre stressing force. So, we can have manual diagrams, manual diagrams. So what can the magnet diagrams do? Magnet diagram will be like this. What, what can it do? 
because we have already selected the p value 1 of p 1 of rp we can use the upper limit and the lower limit so the moment we draw a maximum diagonal for any section on the beam we can always get an upper limit and a lower limit so what we do is we will so which means the moment we select a priestess for this beam, we have the lower boundaries, upper, bound, upper boundaries, and lower boundaries. We have supports. We have the limits. I'm doing a highly exaggerated diagram because uh, we will not get such a wide limit, but it doesn't matter. So then we know EP is equal to ES minus M2 over RP. M2 over RP. So which, which means now we can find this is ES applied. The moment you know the ES profile, we can find EP profile. Something like that. So this is EP. What, what is the speciality of EP? Within EP, EP, we we can have only one coordinate profiles. That means a profile. That generate M2 as C. And then we know any bending moment diagram that fits inside EP diagram is. A on four dent. But here we have a small problem. Problem is ES is in meters, bending moment is in kilo newton meters. So, because of that reason, to convert this to ES2. Kilo newton meters, we multiply it by RP, we take RP. Yes. Then what is it? Kilo newton meters. So it's very easy to compare kilo newton meters with kilo newton meters rather than comparing meters with kilo newton meters. So because of that, we do a small trick. We actually calculate RP. Yes. And then fit the bending moment diagram not into ES, but we fit it, fit it into RPES. We fit it into RPES. So once we fit it into RPES, what can we do? So that is. The steps will be step number three. This will be step number four. So this will be step number five. Sorry, I made a small mistake here. This is not ES, this is EP. EP is in meters, so we are going to fit RPEP. So 
and we are going to fit a bending moment diagram into RP. And then, what is the last step? Because we know ES is equal to EP plus M2 of RP. Convert whatever this RPEP. Once you know RPEP, you can always find EP. And from that, you will find S. Once you find ES, that will be the final bending moment diagram. So, so the final profile and the speciality of that profile is to generate exactly the more secondary moments that you have assumed. Because secondary moments had been the biggest problem that bothered design engineers because you know if you do not assume a value for secondary moment initially and alter the bending moment diagram and use the final bending moment diagram for calculations always you will find at the end of the design calculations now you because you have not used the final bending moment diagram all your calculations are invalid so this is the problem that bothered all the senior structural engineers who were designing bridges. So, so we sorted this out, developing a new design method. So in this new design method, we have no fear of assuming a value for second moments and generating the final bending moment diagram at the very beginning of the design. And then we have found a method that will allow us to calculate uh, we, sorry, allow us to select a profile that will generate exactly the same values that we have assumed. So the trick is we have an unknown parameter. So we assume the parameter initially, that is M2, and later we have developed a method that will allow us to find a profile that will generate exactly what we have assumed. So all your design calculations should be done only once because the moment you assume ES, well, the moment you select ES, it will generate the assumed values. That means there's no trial and error in this method. It's a, it's a one way process, no trial and error because the unknown parameter is assumed and then it is generated. Is that clear, Panduka? Yes, sir. Thank right? You. So that's how we do it. So I'm going to show you how this can be done on the spreadsheet. How this can be done on the spreadsheet. Because uh, these calculations, please stress concrete, even for a simply supported beam, you have to get you have to create a spreadsheet. Because Without a spreadsheet, you know, performing calculations for every section using the same set of equations is very time consuming because we are using the same set of equations. We have only one set of equations. That is the equation that we have derived for Magnal diagram. And everything is based on that particular diagram. So if we have so much repetition, Computer is ideal, and even uh, so if you want, you can write a computer program. On the other hand, you can uh, clearly see the whole picture by developing a spreadsheet. So I prefer the spreadsheet method, unless we really want to develop a software that can automatically design the bridges. If you are, if you want a program that will automatically design the bridges, then uh, then um, uh, programming language is good because we have so much repetition. But on the other hand, you are a design engineer and you have to produce calculations, you have to show your calculations are right. Then the spreadsheet is good because uh, any other engineer can easily check whether you are what is right. So, uh, so basically, uh, we are going to use the spreadsheet. Okay. Right. So, uh, and the important thing you have to keep in mind is. Uh, this type of spreadsheet can be used 
even for a silk supporter so what are the important things that i have to get so i'll share the screen and i will get the things sorted out let first we we'll see what are the uh, what are the spans like uh, so it has 40 meters 90 meters and it goes up to 130 meters so that means 40 meters 50 meters 40 meters so so i have what i have uh, done here is an example for a beam of 130 meters long you can see it's 130 meter long this is a fairly big one and uh, we are using first span as 40 meters middle span as 50 meters the uh, end span as uh, 40 meters and you might again ask why the uh, 40 50 40 the idea is you know uh, the the end spans will have a higher second moment so because of that reason we have kept the middle spans bigger end spans smaller so by keeping the middle spans bigger and end spans smaller we can always make sure we don't have excessive second moment in the first span in the first span always you know in a continuous beam because the first support is simply supported always you get a higher tagging moment in the first span but if you have a shorter first span longer second span then you can uh, make sure both uh, spans will give more or less the same bending moment again this is advantage because we are going to use the same section everywhere so we don't want uh, very high moments at one span and as very small moments in the other span so that is not good and secondly uh, if you look at a bridge uh, generally the river is river is narrow but during the flood flood period river is wide so when you have a wide middle span uh, slightly shorter end spans actually the main span of the bridge is the uh, main span can cover the river the two spans on the sides can uh, cover the front sections can you understand my brother so basically uh, yes sir if i start like this stop shari so basically uh, we may have a river This is the river. So we have two spans, and we might need another another span here. Why? On this side, because we are in the flood situations. We might need all this width during the floods, but on normal situation, you need only this. so that means if the river is only here now you can do this pier construction on dry land so you don't you don't have to do the construction using a barge on uh, located on the river because you are you are constructing the bridge on the banks not on the not on a not in the middle of the river so this is one of the advantages of going for big because it can handle the flood situation as well as the normal situation very well and this has actually happened a lot in uh, mahaveli river uh, so they have constructed the the embankment and constructed the narrow bridge although i say it's narrow it's a long bridge but uh, during a flood uh, flood situation uh, the embankment has washed away leaving the big gap between the road and the Uh, beach uh, because part of the embankment behind the abutment has been washed away so they had to construct another one or two spans so this type of thing happen in bridges when you do not consider the flood situation during the selection of the span of the or the total length of the bridge so we had all we always very careful about the total length of the bridge because sometimes 
during the flood situations, we need a bigger bridge than what you need during a normal uh, dry spells, right? So that also we have to keep in mind. So always um, uh, the other advantage is if you have equal spans, then we have a diagram like that. But on the other hand, we have, sorry, it's a wrong diagram. So if you have equal spans, then the bending moment diagram will be like this. Whereas when you have longer spans, the middle, then you can get a bending moment diagram. Same amount, same, all same. So there's a particular advantage of going for um, longer middle span and uh, shorter end spans. So those are practical aspects. So you can see I have also used 40 50 40 combination. So basically, if you look at the spans, they are there. Only thing that you have to be little, uh, there's nothing to concern, but you know, the sign convention I have used for writing this uh, spreadsheet is uh, compression negative, tension positive. But you don't have to really worry because uh, it doesn't matter because it, uh, once you write the equations in the correct way, always you get the same answer. So. So only thing is when I'm when I give the uh, compressive stress, I have to uh, consider it as, it as a negative value. But uh, if you look at the equation that I have derived, I have derived it considering a different sign condition. In, the, in that sign condition, I have considered compression as positive. But here I have considered compression as negative. It's, a, it's not a big major problem because uh, the the same set of equations will finally result. Uh, so, so when you prepare the spreadsheet, it's not, it will not make any of a difference, right? So uh, then, uh, then uh, you know, here if you go for the down, I can, you can see I have calculated. Uh, so uh, the top, half the width of the bridge is five meters. And uh, so the, I'm trying to give you some of the parameters I have used. Uh, I have considered an equivalent uh, thickness. So width of the bridge is half the bridge is five meters. And uh, so the total width of the bridge is 10 meters. That means two lanes of 3.5 meters each plus 1.5 meter walkway on either side. 3.5 plus 1.5 is 5 meters. 5 into 2 is 10 meters. So the total width of the top plunge is 10 meters. The, the, the average thickness of the top plunge is 0.3 meters. Uh, depth of the section is 2.1 meters. Now, now why 2.1 is important? There are two reasons. One is uh, when you have 2.1 meter, a man can easily walk inside the box. That's number one. Number two is that uh, when you look at the span over depth ratio, when you look at span over depth ratio, that is uh, uh, 50 divided by 2.1 gives the answer as 23.8. So the span over depth ratio for a, a continuous beam can be between 18 to 25. So I'm, I'm within that, I'm within that. 
So that and the other advantage is, you know, in a large section like this, people can walk inside. Depth of the section is 2.1 meters. So our height is only about 1.65 meters. So uh, width of the half of the bottom planche, 2.5 meters. And then uh, thickness of the bottom flange is 175 millimeters. And uh, the width of the web is 0.35 meters. Now width of the web is a critical parameter because web is used effectively only at the ends. So don't uh, use a uh, thickness uh, that is too much, but uh, because we are going to have something like 70 millimeter diameter uh, ducts uh, carrying 15.7 um, millimeter squared strands, about 709 strands. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, we have to consider that uh, we need to do mat soft reinforcement inside mat and outside mat. Then we have to have the duct. Then we have to insert the vibrators. So when you consider all those requirements, a 350 millimeter is not excessive, but it may be a pretty reasonable value, especially if you are going to anchor any of the cables on the web. Sometimes we find uh, due to construction constraints, we cannot have one cable from one end to the other. So, so we have to uh, say after a span, we might have to anchor some of the cables and start some additional cables. So, because of that reason, we have to uh, ensure that uh, some of the cables can be anchored unless you are going to use external cables. So there's a possibility of using external cables, external pre-stressing. That means the pre-stressing uh, strands or the ducts are placed outside the beam, but inside the middle open, open space, inside the middle open space of, a, of the box curve. So basically, if I stop sharing, now I can show you how I have converted that information to a, a box ladder. And uh, so because we are analyzing it as a village to get the bending moment, as I explained earlier, I have to consider two I sections, two I sections. Uh, so I can say the I of this shape is equivalent to an I of this shape. Because as far as there's no torsion, I is, both eyes will have the same behavior. So I can easily say that as well. So if I go back to the spreadsheet, if I go back to the spreadsheet, So, and then once I know all these dimensions, I can calculate uh, the location of the centroid 1.465 meters above the, uh, above the bottom. So distance is 1.4, 4, 1.407, 1.407. One meter and four and a seven millimeters, right? And then uh, I can also have uh, y one and y two. Uh, y two is uh, one point four zero six five. Y one is minus six nine three five. Second amount of area also calculated can be calculated for an I section. Then he said one is minus. He said one is minus, he said two is plus. plus. Right. So, so these are these are real highway bridge, right? These are not fictitious values, they are they are the real values of a highway bridge, right? 
so then i i need the compressive stresses at transfer and uh, sorry in service and tensile stresses in service i need the second amount of area yeah. i need the area of the section depth of the section y1 by 2 and the cover the cover that i need because i cannot place uh, ducts outside the section so i will say from the outer surface i need 200 millimeters of cover because i have to place reinforcement out, outside the tendon uh, outside the tendons or the outside the ducts so so because of all these reasons i am keeping uh, in the bridge having 2.1 meter total depth 200 millimeter to the cent maximum centroid for the uh, cable uh, for the for the ducts so means that you know i will get certain portion of the duct uh, about this and then i need uh, reinforcement i need the cover for protection a minimum something like a minimum of about uh, 50 millimeter or 40 millimeter so when you consider all these things uh, this 200 millimeter is uh, not 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 too much but uh, sometimes you if you are refining the design sometimes you might find that even 150 is okay but for this particular design i have considered it as 200 millimeters and then because we know y1 and cover you can see point 1.4065 minus 0.2 is 1.2065 so, so we know the minimum eccentricity and maximum eccentricity and uh, if i stop sharing and minimum eccentricity and maximum eccentricity is these two boundaries. So the centroid is here, this E max, this E minimum. So I have to, I cannot play, place the ducts outside the cable, uh, the, the section. Like so uh, now I'll share again. Right. And uh, then uh, I have to do the relay analysis. So I'm not going to do a relay analysis, but I'm going to show you the final result. Final result, right? So the because I have earlier shown you that uh, uh, we had to just analyze the relay and four dead loads, uh, superimposed loads, uh, live loads, any kind of pattern loading, whatever we get, we have to analyze it, and then finally we will end up with the bending moment diagram which will have a maximum moment and a maximum moment and a minimum moment mb is the maximum moment ma is the minimum moment and you can see these moment values are not uh, a substantial 17000 here again you get 18000 so 18000 kilonewton meters is a big moment and over the support we are getting 23000 over support, we are getting 23,000. It's a massive moment. But uh, can you remember, we, uh, because we know the range, we said Z1 can, required can be calculated. Z1 is equal to MB minus MA divided by uh, FCW minus FTW. So basically, the maximum range that would be allowed. Uh, for the stressors to vary, and from that straight away we can calculate uh, the maximum uh, z1 and z2 required. So our task should be that uh, we have to ensure that z1 and z2 selected are bigger than the required values. So if you look at z1 and z2, uh, the requirement we can go along this one. Z1 and z2 required. Required, is said one is said to required is uh, so for every section we can calculate it and uh, always we have to concentrate a lot on the critical section. So here 0.8836 and you can see uh, out of that also he said one is uh, a big value he said two is the smaller value and he said two I have selected is 1.025 
the requirement is 0.8836. I have selected a section slightly bigger than the minimum required. I have selected the section slightly bigger than the minimum required. Minimum required is 0.8836 I have selected 1.02, slightly bigger. So, uh, so that is, is that is okay. Now the next step is, although we say this is the bending moment diagram due to loading, we know that is not the final bending moment diagram. So we have to assume the secondary moment. So here I have assumed the secondary moments and the speciality of secondary moments is it occurs due to uh, change in the support reaction. So because of that reason, we know Secondary moment diagram occurs due to the changes in the support moments. So because of that reason, it varies like this. So if I know this value, and I know that it has to be divided into eight sections here, 10 sections here, eight sections here. So if I know this has 7,000, this has 8,000, I can find the value at each and every section. Each and every section, we can find the value. If you know the value, if you select, so what you have to select is only the value at the support. Only the value at the support. Select the value at the support. Rest can be calculated. Because, you know, it's a, it varies in a straight line, it varies in a straight line. So that's the advantage. So again, uh, you can uh, simply calculate these values, M2. And here you can see, I have selected, this says 7,967. And 7,967 has been selected uh, and you can see there's something called a M as built. I will explain it later. But this is this as built is the actual bending moment diagram that you get due to the construction sequence. And that has a value of 9959. So divided by 9959. So I get a ratio of 0 0.8. So I have assumed the second moment at the first internal support is 80% of the construct the, the bending moment that you get due to self-weight. And here you can see the value of this one is 7,691. And the value I have selected is 7114. So I can see uh, this as built value. As built means uh, the bending moment diagram that you get due to the way that you have constructed, 7,691. 7,691 multiplied by 0.8. No. 7,114 divided by 7,691. Uh, 7,691, uh, 7,114 four, seven, divided by 7,691. So I get, I have assumed 92.5%. So I have gone a little beyond 80%. I have gone up to 90%, 92.5%. Right, so, so because I have assumed the values, we will not worry about it. Now you can see 7,967, 7,967 divided by 8, 995. Here you can see the value I have entered, 995. I just multiplied that, entered it manually. And here the secondary moment is actually going to change from change from 
7,967 up to 7,114. So 7,967 minus 7,114 divided by 10 means 85.3. 85.3. So you can see 7,967 minus 85 is 788. Sorry, 7,882. So here you can see the difference between these two is from 850. And I have divided by 10 because I have 10 sections. So it becomes 85. So 7,967 minus 85 is 7,882. Again, you deduct 85. So finally, when you deduct 85 10 times, you get 7,000. And here again, 7,114. Divided by 8 is 888. So you can see 889. So basically what you see is it's going uh, to uh, uh, all these values uh, from 0 to 7967. It dropped to 7114 in the third support. It goes back to 0. So that's the shape of the Second moment diagram. And the moment we have assumed the second moment, what happens? We have to change the origin of the bending moment diagram. So when you are changing the origin of the bending moment diagram, what happens to the span moments? Span moments will increase. Span moments will increase, right? Span moments will increase. I'll show you that. So basically, I'm saying that I'll not draw an unit up. So what I'm drawing is so you have something like that. And you are changing the origin of the bending moment diagram like this. So what happens? This value increases. The span value increases. This value reduces. This value reduces. So although we say the height reduces, actually it has a higher uh, magnitude because we are getting a lesser uh, negative moment, lesser negative. Lesser negative moment is uh, always bigger than a higher negative moment, right? So, yeah, because we are talking on negative side. So now, now we are happy. Why? Now we have a final bending moment, not the not the one that's going to change because we now we have removed that uncertainty by assuming a value. Now we have removed the uncertainty. And now this is, we are happy. Why? We have a final bending moment. Like, like in the simply supported case. Simply supported case, straight away we get the final bending moment. But here, we have to assume and do some uh, calculations, manipulations, and then only we can get the final bending moment diagram. So once you have a final bending moment diagram, I have assumed, after looking at the many diagrams, I have assumed, okay, Value of 26,004p and uh, a loss ratio of 0.7. And then the moment I know the pre stressing force, so I can only, from the Manian diagram, I can find two upper limits and two lower limits. So basically, uh, if you know the limit uh, for a given section, we can draw the Manian diagram. Minus Z2 over A, minus Z1 over A, and we have four lines. So, what did happen? So we have four lines, and uh, we have selected a pre stressing force. And for this pre stressing force, we get uh, two lower boundaries. Those are the two lower boundaries. We we'll get two upper boundaries. Out of uh, when you have four boundaries, you have to select which one gives the actual range. So that is not a major problem. So, what you do is I'll share the screen again. And uh, so, here you can see I get four boundaries. Out of those four boundaries, I can select two boundaries. And the moment I do this, what, what do I get? I stop share 
I get this black color diagram. Black color diagram. Because I know the secondary moments, now I can uh, get, because I know M2, I know RP, I know ES, I can get the green color diagram. So that means straight away I can get the green color diagram. That's what I have done. So you can see here I can get the green color diagram. I can get the, the moment I have the ES diagram, I can get the EP diagram because EP is equal to ES minus M2 over RP. R is known, M2 is known, P is known, ES is known. So you can find EP. So once you know EP, what I have done is I have calculated uh, RPEP, I have calculated RPEP. Can you remember I told you that, you know, EP is in moment, um, is in meters. Uh, the, the bending moment diagram that you are going to get due to a set of loading is in kilonewton meters. So it's better to convert EP to RPEP, then you will get uh, kilonewton meters. So what I have done is I have converted EP here to EP, so you can see blue color one, RP, EP. So I'm getting a bending moments. Here I'm getting a bending moment. Now what should I do? Now I have to find a bending moment diagram. I have to find a set of loads. That will give a bending moment diagram that will lie between these two limits. And here you can see I have found it. Uh, this is done uh, using SAP 2000. So what I have done is I have modeled the beam on SAP 2000 and I have applied various loads on SAP 2000 and found the bending moment diagram. This was done manually, not, uh, you cannot automate it because we are using SAP 2000 to generate the bending moment. So I have, so I have generated bending moment diagram by altering the loads until I get bending moments in between these two. So you can see 4,261 is the upper limit. 8,135 is the lower limit. So I have considered 5,076. Similarly, I have uh, a hogging, uh, hogging moment value of mi minus 16,950 and minus 15,165. So I have uh, tried and found a value of 16,250. So likewise, you know, I have found a bending moment diagram manually, and then I have entered these values manually. So you have to see because there's no way I can automate it here because uh, you know I'm using SAP 2000 to generate this concordant profile because every concordant profile is a bending moment diagram due to a actual set of loads that you can apply, right? So you cannot just arbitrarily say, this is a bending moment diagram by drawing something like a bending moment. It has to be obtained by applying a set of loads. Right? So what should I do now? If I have concord, then I can actually uh, divide this bending moment by R, P, I can divide this by RP and then I can get the actual load. Let's take an example 10,546. 10,546 divided by 0 0.7 divided by 26,000. I get 0 0.579. Sorry, uh, 24 EP actual is uh, 5,000, sorry, I looked, yes, I looked at 10,546. So this is RPEP type, you think? I want EP, so I have to divide this by, this by RP. RP is 0.7 multiplied by 26. So I divide 10,546 by 0.7 multiplied by 26,000, I get the answer is 
point five seven nine. Now I have the actual EP value. Then, uh, when you know EP, what is the next thing you can do? You can calculate ES. What is ES? I'm going to show you that. I'll get a yellow color for that. Uh, I'll get a color. Right. Okay, now we have this one. Right. So, now let's look at this example, uh, ESEP actual also I will get some of the color so that we can easily see it. And I will get uh, some color for that. Okay, right. So now you can see 10,546 divided by 0 0.7 multiplied by 26,000 gave. 0.5794 and EP actual is there. ES is equal to EP plus EP plus M2 over RP. M2 over RP. So, what is M2 for this particular section? M2 is 2987. M2 is 2987. So, 2897. Divided by 0 0.7 divided by 26,000. I get 0.159. So I have read 0.159 to this one plus 0 0.5794. I get 0 0.738. 0 0.5794, 0 0.5794 plus uh, M2 here is M2 is 2987, 2987 divided by RP divided by divided by 0. 0.7 multiplied by 27. 0. 0.7435. 0. 0.7435. So I get that answer. And that is the actual profile. Then what I have done is so all this beta and all these parameters is to calculate the secondary bonus. And I have calculated this uh, area of these two uh, bending moment uh, this uh, integral rpep dx that uh, can you remember the integration i told you and from that uh, i can calculate the secondary moments and here you can see uh, i have assumed the value of 7967 7967 and 7114 these are the assumed values and what are the actual values generated? 7,972 and 7,131. Small difference is there because we have been doing these numerical calculations. And also, I will show you that, you know, I could not fit concordant very well everywhere. And I can show you. Just look at some of these sections. Uh, now, here, here is... Here you can see there's a small violation. Here, here also you can see there's a small violation because uh, this is minus 2000. Uh, that's no, no, there's no violation here. And if you look at these two sections, again, no problem. And somewhere here there might be. Mm. Uh, there you are, here. Here you can see there's a small violation because the value should be in between minus 9,783 9, and minus 3,300, but I have got uh, minus 10,802. There's a small violation here. So basically, when you have a violation, uh, there can be a slight change in the uh, secondary moment uh, that is generated, and that's why you get a small, uh, slight difference in the secondary moment. Uh, from the value that you assumed, but you can see it's only a minor. So basically, I have assumed a secondary moment initially, 
and uh, I selected a profile that will generate whatever I have assumed. Uh, but uh, for that, I have the dual after method uh, where uh, you know the steps I have explained in great detail to you. So, but uh, what I have shown here with the spreadsheet is this method where we assume a second moment and we generate the same second moment can actually be done practically. So we can practically do that and generate the assumed values very easily by using a spreadsheet. Or you can even write a computer program for this by using Python or Visual Basic or Fortran 77. You can use one of those languages. But these days, because everybody is using Python, you can uh, use Python and do that. So basically, that's how it goes. And uh, I have written all these programs in Fortran 77. That was some uh, 1988, 89 era. So 35 years ago, I have used Fortran 77 and C for many of these things. But uh, these days, uh, I think everybody is using Python. So you also can. Do it. On the other hand, you can clearly see what's going on when you develop it on a spreadsheet. So, Banduga, is it clear? Uh, I have yes, shown sir. the steps. Yeah, but I have, I, have, that... I have a lot more lines on my spreadsheet mm -hmm. that I use for calculations, but those are not important to understand the method. Uh -huh. Okay. And so there's a request for the spreadsheet as well. Yeah, yeah, I can give this. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll email it to you. Okay. Right? Uh, I uh, generally I send it by. Uh, do I have your email, Manu? Yes, sir. Yes. What is your email? Uh, Banduka dot Kurupu. Uh, Banduka. Yeah, yeah. I should yeah. Have. So I'll, I'll send it. No problem. Okay. Right. So uh, I mean, uh, this. So anybody can develop it. I can share it because I just develop it. And then a uh, lot of graphics are also there because you know I did not show the graphics, but uh, you know everything that you. Draw, calculate can be drawn by using uh, graphics. Uh, your plot facility is available on uh, on uh, Excel. So I have plotted all these things. And uh, so you can see so many different diagrams are there. And, uh, and some of these are big values. So that means that these are moment, these are not just the section. Whereas uh, here you can see. This is the section, this inside. And here, can you remember I showed, I told you there's a small violation that I could, I did not bother to correct. Here, can you see? This cable goes little out of the, upper limit is red, lower limit is blue. What I have selected here goes little out. Yes. And here also, there's a, there's a small problem. But, but those are not big problems because what we do is, uh, when, we, uh, when we select, uh, this um, uh, FCW and the stress range, we generally keep an allowance of about uh, one newton per millimeter squared for any unforeseen effects that we cannot directly take into account at this stage. But when you are doing the detailed calculations, once you select the cables, everything is known. Now we have to do a huge range of calculations. Those are the Detailed calculations to show that your initial assumption, like 70% of the uh, sorry, 30% losses would be valid. And then sometimes, you know, you might be interested in doing some pre patching gauge calculation according to Euro code, but there are a lot of values. So you might, you might like to do it. Or sometimes you might like to do the temperature, uh, ca the, the calculations for temperature induced loads. So, so because we are, we can use so many different types of uh, situations. When you are calculating the cable profile, generally we keep an allowance of about one newton per millimeter squared. So that is just a buffer. So that you know, if you if the if the allowable stress is twenty, we might enter the allowable stress as ninety. So we have a small buffer when you are doing the calculations. So uh, later when we do the detailed calculations, we'll find the violations are as low, uh, will be very low. So because we don't want to keep on calculating these things over and over again, because once you do get this right, 
the next step is uh, you know now you know all the details you know the cable you know the initial pre stage everything is known now uh, you can do many other calculations but uh, important thing is to get the cable profile right with an optimized cable uh, profile and uh, optimized pre stressing force because we don't want to use uh, too high pre stressing forces but i can just show you one trick let's say i will i allocate 20000 now that's the beauty of spreadsheet now you, you look at this diagram these are graphics uh, you might find that these graphics are all out now can you see that uh, can you see here this uh, 26 the 20000 is not enough this uh, upper limit goes below the below the lower limit can you see Yes, sir. so that means straight away because the moment you have graphics, you can straight away say, see whether the pre-stress force selected is enough or not. So, so, so the, now I can increase it to about twenty-five, twenty-two, twenty-three thousand. So that is the beauty of spreadsheet. So the moment you do one thing, now you can use the graphics and see whether you are okay. Now here you can see. Uh, it looks okay but uh, here it's pretty close pretty narrow and uh, i have gone up to 26000 but later you know next time i will show you actually i had used 26000 and 23000 will never work i can show there's there are few other theories that we can learn from about this method but uh, those things i will explain uh, next time right okay Okay, sir. Right, and but sir, this is the method. This is a very uh, straightforward method, and uh, this is a very special method because uh, we assume some values and we generate the ex exact values that we have. So that's a very special design method. So these are one of the very advanced design methods that you can use for uh, designing uh, continuous pre-stress concrete beams, and uh, you have to keep in mind. in sri lanka at the moment we have this uh, uh, port access road elevated express railing uh, that is having this box uh, box girders but due to the construction method uh, that design can vary slightly because always you have to look at build the construction technique into the into the uh, your into your calculation so that's why i have Uh, two moments here. One is called a monolithic, and the other one is called asphalt. So next time I'll explain all these uh, different, uh, you know, special situations that you have to consider. But today I have concentrated on uh, explaining the method. Okay. Okay. Right. So any questions uh, in the chat? Uh, so the several were asking the spreadsheet. Uh, yeah. That. Many are asking for the spreadsheet. Huh? Yes. So sir. let me uh, send the mobile number to you. So is that uh, please uh, share the spreadsheet? Yes. So all are keen to get the spreadsheet that I will do. And uh, answer one uh, clarification. Uh, yeah. Uh, how uh, how crucial the knowledge on waterway calculations for bridge engineers for cases like so explained in. Yeah. Uh, extension of expands like that yeah yeah actually uh, it is something that you have to get the help of a uh, good uh, hydrological engineer right mm -hmm. yeah. because as structural engineers you know uh, it's difficult for us to have all that type of knowledge right as we go mm -hmm. with uh, specialized uh, geotechnical engineers to understand uh, geotechnical aspects uh for uh, especially with the climate change effects it's always good to uh, get the advice from a hydrological engineer who can uh, look at the flood situations and also predict the future effects of climate change on the flood situation because now it is not like the early days where you know you, you we knew about the bridge but uh, or the river but these days it is very difficult to know about the river because uh, because you know 
with the effects of climate change, a lot of things are changing. So because of that reason, it's a good idea that we get the services of a hydrological engineer who can actually, uh, you know, tell us uh, how to handle the situation. Okay. So that's my advice. So generally, even for though I know geotechnical engineering a lot, uh, I always uh, get the services of a uh, geotechnical engineer when I do bridges or buildings. The reason is. Geotechnical engineers always know more than what we know about soil as structural engineers, right? So similarly, always uh, it's a good idea to get the service of a hydrological engineer who can uh, predict the effects of climate change on the kind of uh, river flows and so on. Because uh, this is a complicated matter, and, but if there are books, Indian books uh, by, I can't remember the name, there are a few books that will allow you to, uh, there are, they give rules of thumb for doing a lot of calculations. But actual real, uh, river characteristics are far more complicated than what you get in uh, these books. So that's why we have to always get the help. So for example, if you contact a person like Professor Ladit Rajapaksha of Department of Civil Engineering, uh, they have a lot more data than what we have. Because they have been uh, dealing with the irrigation systems of Sri Lanka, and they even have satellite uh, data on topography. Everything is on their computer. So they have a lot more data than us. So it's always a good idea to uh, contact a hydrological engineer and get some advice. Okay, sir. Right? So, sir, okay. Anyway, sorry? sir, can you explain how to construct it? It's a continuous parabolic section. Then how yeah. can give the pre-stress for the cable inside the center yeah, cable? That's what, that's, what, that's what I'm going to show you next time. Right? Okay, sir. thank uh, you. The next, next lecture number four will be on all these construction aspects and what is going to happen due to creep, shrinkage. So there are so many parameters that you have to pay some attention. And uh, next week, the lecture will be on all those, uh, covering all those aspects. Okay, and then, and then, not only cover is that you know how to build, you know, bring those uh, effects into the spreadsheet, so that uh, when you are doing the calculations, automatically all those uh, special effects are taken into account. So that's what we are going to do next time. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Right. So in that case, shall I okay, stop sir. the lecture? Okay, sir. Right. And uh, okay. I would like to invite uh, Engineer Bashita to do the word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Bonduka. Uh, dear all, uh, I am pleased to deliver this word of thanks for the 12th session of the webinar series on structural design of highway bridges uh, conducted by Professor Tishan Jai Singh. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to express our heartfelt uh, gratitude to Professor Tishan Jai Singh for, for his uh, insightful and informative presentation. Uh, the webinar series has been a great success and we have received numerous positive feedback from the participants. This would not have been possible without the support of CAC Chairman, Engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunwardhana, the IECL Secretariat, Publicity Department and the IT team. We would like to thank them for their dedication and hard work in making this event a success. We would also like to exp express our appreciation to all the participants for their active participation and insightful questions. Uh, your, your enthusiasm and engagement have made this webinar series a valuable learning experience for all. Uh, finally, we would like to inform you that the next session of the webinar series will be on the 30th of May. We hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much.